Yeah, all right, this is Shane from Liberty Under Attack, and I'm here with uh, Derek Bros uh, from the Conscious Resistance, uh, an outlet where I'm actually a contributor to. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, freedom cells. So, uh, Mr. Bros, welcome back to uh, Liberty Under Attack Radio. How are you doing this evening, sir? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on again. It's been a while. Yeah, it has. It has. I think uh, January with uh, Agorism. Uh, as part of the direct action series, you're going to be in the direct action series about three times by the time this is all said and done. Sure. But uh, got a lot of uh, good input. So, um, so uh, uh, good deal. So, for those who are unfamiliar with your work, uh, why don't you go ahead and provide a brief introduction of uh, who you are and uh, what you do? Absolutely. So, I'm a freelance journalist. I'm, I live in Houston, Texas. Uh, community activist. I've been involved with activism out in the real world, organizing, building community gardens, uh, just hosting different community events to try to get people active and community reliant, self reliant. Um, since 2010 with the Houston Freethinkers, and as you said, uh, I started the Conscious Resistance Network website as a team where anybody can contribute ideas related to anarchism, uh, spirituality, consciousness, meditation, a whole range of topics really, and just have good debate and discuss those ideas. And you know, that's sort of what I do with full time is just try to spread awareness through writing books, writing essays and journalism and videos and all kinds of things, you know, just doing mm -hmm. what I can try to spread the message. Fantastic, fantastic. And you uh, you actually released uh, your second book here recently. Why don't you tell the listeners a little about that and where they can find it? Yeah, sure. So the second book in the Conscious Resistance trilogy, myself and John Vibes, who's another activist author from uh, Maryland, we co-wrote the books together and we're working on a third one and it's going to involve a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Um, but the second book focuses more on, uh, I guess you could say, the human, the emotional aspect of the search for freedom, whereas the first book uh, we consider it to be the body of our philosophy and ideas where it covers a whole lot of ground and tries to give people different starting points for a range of topics, you know, meditation, psychedelics, anarchism, just all this, you know, broad information. And uh, the second one focuses more on, again, like the, the human aspect, the alienation that some people deal with as they wake up to realizing that a lot of what they've been told, most of what they've been told about the world is a lie, whether it's related to the, gov the government or just world history, things like that. And often people get stuck in anger and alienation, confusion, sometimes depression, or, and you've, you know, I've met different types of activists, some people who they really know what's going on, but they're just at this phase where they're just so like mad and just you know, it just, I think over a while that consumes you. So we want to try to help people have this, you know, conscious uh, resistance, the idea behind that basically just being a philosophical awakening that um, lends itself towards self-governance, you know, building strong autonomous communities outside of the state. And we believe that that starts in a spiritual and emotional process as well. You, know, you, have, to, you have to care enough about yourself to think that you're worthy of self, you know, ownership and of doing something amazing with yourself. And when you're lost in that confusion, that depression, et cetera, it's kind of hard to pull yourself up out of that and get on the, the right path towards freedom, whatever that's going to look like. And it's easy for the state and other institutions to come in and manipulate people when they're in those state of mind. So we believe it's equally important to discuss that. And so the essays in the book, the first part of it sort of focus on uh, just more empowerment, looking at different areas first from the, the relationship you have with yourself, you know, the way you view yourself and kind of trying to build people up and then looking at relationships to uh, family and friends and kind of the world at large. And in the second half of that book gives people tools around meditation, positive affirmations, just trying to reinforce this positive, empowering mentality, not through not only in words, but through your actions as well. And uh, I think it's important for us to relearn and unlearn a lot of the negative self-limiting things that we may have picked up along the way and as i said the state is more than willing to take advantage of those uh, shortcomings those insecurities and all the various things that we each deal with you know our idiosyncrasies so the idea being that once we start to heal and process through those things we become more empowered beings and recognize the value of liberty and freedom for everyone and that you know plays its role in the bigger picture definitely yeah, yeah you're exactly right and i've enjoyed both of your books but i like this i enjoyed the second one more um, just the the focus that that was on it, uh, yeah, and, and you're definitely right. People get when people kind of uh, wake up to the realities of the state, uh, it does. I mean, I had I had that 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 um, there was a time where I was really really angry, and it was a lot more emotional than than rational. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took me about uh, I, I started the website two and a half years ago. There wasn't really much on it, not much activity, but uh, yeah, for the first couple of years, up until probably oh I don't know like March of last year. Yeah, it was it was anger. Like I wasn't uh, anger and, and kind of uh, yeah, I was pissed off uh, at the world. Wrong with you know being angry like in in itself. You know I think that some people think 
uh, like meditation and different spiritual teachings are trying to suppress, you know, human nature. And I, I've learned, at least in my experience, that that's not really a part of it either. It's just that, you know, you can recognize your anger and you can be like, wow, like these people are really screwing us over. They're doing some, you know, horrible things. That makes me angry. That makes me want to do something. And, you know, this primal sense of me figures like, let's go smash somebody or like, you know, just, <laughs> start a war or whatever but then you know once you can work through that and not let that kind of consume you you can take that energy and that uh you know that empowerment because that's what it is it's like your body your mind wants to do something about something that they feel wronged by you feel wronged by uh but you can redirect that energy into something that is much more powerful than you know getting out your momentary primal release of you know violence or anger that'll ultimately typically lead to more problems with the state and instead you can take that energy sort of turn it on its head and go build something, you know, create something brand new, which is what, like I said, that's what our next book is really going to heavily focus on, how to build these uh, communities that we have in mind and just sort of putting out our vision, of course, not a monopoly, like this is the way everybody needs to live, but just in this grand scheme of autonomous communities, sort of a panarchist world that we see, this would be one of our, the communities that we think, and we think it could be a model that could work for other people. Right on, right on. Awesome, awesome. So let's let's get into uh, the the subject for the evening. So uh, it's always important to first define our define our terms. Uh, so what what is what is a freedom cell? Cool. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about freedom cells because it seems like more and more people are coming to this idea, whether they call it that term or not, really is irrelevant. Um, but a freedom cell, it I've also heard it called an octolog, um, and some people would even say. An earlier term, affinity group, is, is related, but I think what makes a freedom cell unique is uh, the basis of it is, say, eight to ten people, but ideally eight people. Um, some people even say, you know, four men and four women balanced, um, but that's, again, up to probably the freedom cell itself. But the idea of being eight people that come together and they form this little cell that can educate each other, can uh, be equally prepared. So uh, the way I've seen it put into action, the way we're putting into action in Houston, is not only so you go together, maybe your eight group of people, you go have a camp out and you guys teach each other how to build fires. And now everybody in that group knows how to build a fire. At the same time, everybody's working on getting three months worth of backup supply of food so that you know you've got seven other people you can count on that are equally prepared as you. Everybody in that group knows how to use a firearm, you know, in defense if necessary or to hunt or whatever the situation could be. Um, everyone maybe has an encrypted form of communication that they can use to communicate sensitive information or just things they don't want to be put on Facebook or wherever else. Um, and you can teach each other philosophical ideas, you know, hands-on skills within this group. It being basically, this is like, you know, your go-to first little cell, your circle that you go to when you need help, you know, and, and uh, that's sort of the basis of where the idea has started. And since then, myself and others have started to try to extrapolate from there and see like, what other way could this little cell of people be used? And the idea being that when you start with that in your own little community, Maybe once you get to the point of having enough people, each of those eight people involved can also go start another freedom cell directly in their community. So then you've got eight people each starting their own, and that's you know eight more groups of eight to ten people. So you're at eighty to hundred people right there, spread across one geographic area. And you can imagine as it starts to happen in different parts of the country that these form a larger network. And uh, you know so these little cells are like they're awesome and amazing and powerful and powered on their own. But then together we can start to form like a larger network. Not, not anything hierarchical or you know, centralized, but just a way for these resources, these ideas, these tools that start to develop in this structure to be shared, the knowledge to be diffused. And I think that's really the stage that we're at. And I also think that as far as agorist uh, philosophy and strategy in the New Libertarian Manifesto, when Konkin describes the phases of going between agor from statism to agorism, um, that freedom cells are kind of be the beginning of these agoras that he described, you know, and just one of the ways that this, they're going to start to spread are these little pockets. And he sort of described that as well, that there would be pockets of people starting to do this. And, um, you know, within our freedom cell, there's sort of discussions about, okay, let's take this now and get land together and see what kind of things we can build using this structure. As I said, there's various ideas that you know, we can get into more about other ways that I think that this could be used. But generally the idea is, you know, you have that core of people. So you have a hurricane, blizzard, or you know, economic collapse, or whatever it may be, some sort of, you know, disaster, emergency situation. You've got people that you can count on, depend on, you know, and your families can work together uh, to get out of the city. Or if it's like, hey, we need to hunker down, like where we're at, whatever you do may have determined, and you know, all these ideas can be uh, discovered and and discussed amongst this group, and it really becomes your go-to people. You know, the people that you can count on in these situations and. 
Um, you know, some people will say that they're in, living in an area where they don't have access to that many people, which is definitely our numbers are not where they could be. But even if it's just one ind individual and as the freedom cell idea spreads, you know, one freedom cell might be people who are spread across, you know, 30 miles or something like that, but that's the best they can do right now. So you still try to find some way, even if it's just to come together online to share knowledge and information and try to like, hey, you guys work on this, I'll work on it where I'm at. And we'll just try to work together and sh teach each other our progress and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different ways it can be applied, even if you don't directly have somebody in your you know community right now. Um, you can start one yourself and just say, hey, I'm an individual out here. I'm going to be learning things and hosting Skillshares for anybody who wants to come. I've also told people, check out like farmers markets and um, things like that, because generally you're going to find other people who are interested in like sustainability, like growing food and stuff. And that might be a good place to meet somebody. Maybe you won't even necessarily be aligned with them philosophically at first, but you know, you connect on growing food and you know, you learn, you build that relationship. And then through that, you know, these ideas and these conversations come up and you get to maybe introduce somebody else to the, this philosophy and these ideas and get them to understand why you're trying to do this. And then, you know, before you know it, you've recruited somebody new to this freedom zone who's ready to go build something that doesn't involve the state. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So it sounds like, I, I guess just initially, like uh, the concept of freedom cells or the strategy of freedom cells kind of incorporates a, a lot of a lot of different things. Uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of security teams. We'll talk about that here momentarily. Uh, but like security teams, mutual aid societies, mm -hmm. um, like uh, um, I guess just co-ops, which is in line with the, the mutualist philosophy. Um, so yeah, it seems like a lot of things are being incorporated into that. And uh, and yeah, that, that was one question I had. Like, like here where I live, uh, uh, for the for the, for the first uh, year of doing the show, I didn't know anybody in my area, um, but I've actually found a couple people uh, pop, have have kind of popped up uh, uh, on my radar within the within one lives in the town that I live in, uh, and another one lives like 15 miles away. So there's like two here, like uh, uh, both one of them one of them is an explicit explicit anarchist. I'm not sure the other one's definitely a libertarian. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 really uh, it's really interesting to see. Like I mean, it's taken a while, but yeah. uh, there seems to be some 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 sort of potential here. So that's that that's definitely a good thing. And yeah, uh, and it, and it's good that you might, because I, I was only thinking like here in Bloomington, but yeah, if I could probably find, uh, uh, within 30 miles, I could probably find some people I could at least get in touch with and, and, and share ideas with. So yeah, awesome. Awesome. Yeah, good deal. Absolutely. You know, and the other thing that I just want to add to what you're just saying, this is some of the thing. one of the things we mentioned in the second book is that we believe that it's John and I, that it's gotten to this point, you know, there's, it's so important for us to move from just, uh, philosophizing and you know debating about these ideas but moving towards putting them into action which I think is freedom cells is, is a tool to get us there and you know all of my work everything that we're working on for this next book and in my personal life has been you know going to see Adam Kokish's land going to spend two weeks on my grandmother's farm developing this freedom cell concept like everything I'm doing is towards getting my own land and putting these ideas into action and showing people hey this is a model we could use to do all kinds of things with you know like you mentioned security teams all kinds of things but what I do want to stress is that as we're building this um, and we're moving from just talk to actually putting these things into action it really is important as cliche as it sounds you know important for people to be the change and to be willing to kind of stand up and represent these ideas like you were saying you've been doing this for a while and now you find other people um, you know that are somewhat close to you you can start developing and building those relationships and expanding your circle and see who else you find because I think it's more important than ever for us to, those of us who are paying attention and see the direction that we, the point is that we live in a completely unsustainable system, whether you believe in statism or not. Like the fact is the way things are set up right now and the direction they're going, there's no way that it can you know, last you know, very long under its, it, it'll collapse under its own weight. So if you wanna be forward thinking, if you wanna be an intelligent person, it's time to plan for what's coming next. You know? And even if that wasn't happening, I think along the way you get more involved and you learn that this is just a better way to live. So my point is it's important for those of us who are interested in creating systems that are not based on violence and that can produce uh, more equitable, equal exchanges you know, through the market and without forcing coercion and happiness and freedom for people. If you understand that and you see a path towards that, you know, speak out loudly about it. Don't be afraid to, to voice yourself because I think we got to just step up to the plate you know, and let other people know. The more of us who speak out and are like, hey, I'm going to you know, broadcast this podcast or I'm going to you know, just start putting up flyers about, hey, you want to get involved in a community group looking for solutions? I mean, it's as simple as doing things like that, being the person willing to take that first step. Other people will come, I promise you. I've seen it happen over the years. And, you know, that's just important to remember because you do feel alone out there a lot. And the Freedom Cells is a way, I think, to kind of get past that and also to take us towards action. 
Definitely, definitely, yeah, and, and and that's that's kind of the point I'm at now. I'm considering. I don't know if I'm sure you've heard of uh, Cal Molinay from Richmond, Virginia, Liberate RVA. Um, I'm considering start like I like I, I for the first year like I, I need to understand the philosophy behind it first, and then start to understand anarchism and like all of that stuff before I actually try to start, I guess, uh, promoting it here in my area. Yeah. But uh, now now I'm at this point where I'm I'm considering starting uh, Liberate uh, Liberate Blono, uh, Bloomington Normal, and uh, yeah, going out and, and doing all the uh, uh, Simon gesturing, which we're gonna discuss uh, second hour of the show. Which I'm not sure that is a form of culture jamming, um, but just a lot of a lot of uh, like I actually want to get out there and, and actually kind of uh, build build the, this community here, uh, this this anti-statist uh, community, much like Cal's doing. So uh, yeah, you're you're definitely correct. It's it's time for action. It's time for action. That's uh, what we're what's we're focusing on here on LUA Radio. So, um, so you mentioned uh, um, eight people. And why is eight uh, an ideal number for a freedom cell? So the eight number comes from I've seen it several different places, but where I originally seen it is based on Bob Podolsky's book who he's from Arizona he's an older dude who's his book is called Flourish um, I'm trying to see if I have my copy here I can't remember the subtitle but it's Flourish like an answer to government and something like that and he basically describes them he calls them octologues and he has kind of his whole um, his whole take on the concept but he's been like a psychologist I forget what other professions he's been involved in and he was a student of another guy who'd been studying people for his whole life the two of them I can't remember the other guy's name I really need to figure his name I mainly know Bob but the two of them have done work together for years studying people studying groups and trying to understand um, you know what's the ideal number where effectiveness tapers off where like you know too little people is just not enough to get big jobs done right too many people there's too many arguments and differences and things start to um, become less effective as well and just through that study and they, they found eight to be the ideal number he said plus or minus one person you know each way so maybe if you got six or seven you could make it work nine or ten as well but they found that under ideal circumstances it would be eight and since I started promoting that idea and through the freedom cells I've gotten so many emails from different people who just like telling me about hey I'm doing this group I didn't know it was called the freedom so this is what I'm working on and just different ideas so it's been really cool and one of them somebody sent me um, a research paper that was basically talking about, I believe it was ancient Greece and ancient Greek, uh, you know, lifestyles and was saying that there was also this idea of eight people working ideally together, just basically trying to send me some information saying, hey, this is a historical idea. People have known for a hmm. while that um, humans seem to function great in groups of eight people. And again, Bob recommends like four women and four men, but I think that should be, this whole idea uh, is all about the individual within that group you know and each freedom cell being different you know so uh, like whenever I talk about my vision of what the land could be or sort of the different ideas that I have on the freedom so I'm one of seven to eight people that we have that are involved in different ways in this group but we have meetings periodically we're all working on getting backup supply of food we're all you know we use a different encrypted uh, chat you know so you just communicate regularly to get together and we're building bug out bags emergency bags like trying to have stock food just a lot of different things we're trying to teach each other and within that structure some of those people are also going to be buying land together so my opinion is only one of you know seven or eight people but together we come together it's like all right this is what I think we should learn and like okay well let's teach each other that and let's focus on that and uh, you know so it's, it's just like a, it's a community tool but yeah, I think that I, eight does seem to work pretty pretty reasonably because there are some projects with just a couple of people, you can't really get certain things done. Um, but obviously, again, if you've got way too many people, then it starts to get more difficult. So, and, and I tend to see that, you know, right now is that people are looking, obviously there's a lot of issues in the world, but we can't necessarily fix them all. We definitely can't fix them when our backyards and our communities are all screwed up. But just the same way we can't fix the world if we're ourselves individually, internally, emotionally all screwed up. So it's just a reflection. You, know, you got to work on yourself. You got to work on your community. And each community is going to look different. So each freedom cell is going to look different. You know, the freedom cell is the smallest sort of cell. The person is the individual is first, the individual. Then there's eight people, right? And then that freedom cell links up with the larger freedom cell. And they become, you know, so different people have different language around it. But eight does seem to be ideal. Okay, very good, very good, and that kind that's uh, uh transitions right into this next question pretty well. Uh, you mentioned encryption. Uh, is that is that like a necessity for communication uh, with the members of a freedom cell? Well, I would say just like I tell anybody, as far as encryption and security goes, that if you're planning on doing something that the state considers to be illegal, you know whether it's a moral act or not, um, I wouldn't even put it anywhere digital phone system or anything like that. Anyways, I'd be having those conversations face to face and in person, you know, really. So uh, the the 
and the encryption in those chat apps, they're helpful, I think, to get people just in, in the idea of practicing a culture of security. Yep. Because really, we've talked about this before where some people are like, oh, well, you know, we just know how much, how many agencies, not just the NSA, all these different people have access to our information. And, you know, we can beat them on one tool. And even if we're encrypted by this device, it's, it's just going to take them a little bit longer. But eventually they can get our information if they want it, you know, bad enough. And I think that's true to some degree. But at the same time, if we just, you know, give up, and we're like, all right, well, I guess then privacy is dead. So there's no reason to even pretend like we can protect our privacy that we're just doing a disservice to ourselves. So by practicing a culture of security and getting the habit of that, and also having those uh, channels open and prepared in case things did get to a point. You know, I don't really think that uh, anything crazy that Donald Trump says could ne uh, necessarily happen, but I think we're also not that far away from it. So when somebody like him says they want to shut down the internet or, you know, do something crazy with the phone lines, <laughs> the thing is, as silly as they sound, you know, there definitely are government mechanisms where they could limit our ability to access, you know, internet and things like that. And if it came down to that, you might want to have some alternative form of communication, even non-digital form of communication, but definitely something protected where it might not be safe after a period of time. And this is, look, historically, it may seem like fantasy and, you know, just, uh, hyperbole to some people to think about that happening in the U.S., but it, it's happened in plenty of other places, you know, once things boil over uh, and the state tries to control its subjects, you know, all of a sudden it's not safe to just organize and to be a free person to express yourself. And if that happened, you would hope that you had some way to get something, you know, quick message across, like meet at the spot, you know, whatever, you know, you have some need to communicate in a protected way. So I think it's a philosophical thing, you know, being able to take a stand as much as possible, but it's also a, a valuable skill to, to just have some way to communicate something rather than on Facebook or, you know, Gmail or you're just your unprotected phone. Yeah, that de definitely, definitely, and that, and I've had that issue, but what before too, like, uh, uh, like encryption does not like it's it's not hard to set up. Like once you do it once, you can help someone do it in like ten or fifteen minutes. It does not take a lot of time. Um, so that that's one hurdle that I've been kind of trying to get across uh, to people. Uh, but, but yeah, you're 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 exactly uh um. Well, actually, let me back up. Uh, and, and yeah, the, the mindset that I had before I started using encryption was well, it was what you just kind of described. Well, I mean. They'll get through any any security anyways, like any encryption. So like, why would I do it? But but then I had kind of a, a change of mind. Like, it, uh, e even if they were able to get into it at some point, like I'm making, I'm being, I'm being a pain in their ass. Yeah. Uh, so uh, and, and then and then yeah, also you. Easy for them. <laughs> no, definitely. And then you can extrapolate that out. Like, uh, if everyone uses encryption, then uh, they're gonna have a, a really hard time uh, <laughs> invading privacy. Uh, but yeah, you, you're exactly right with, with, with I guess, with uh, Leviathan uh, uh, con continuing to grow. Uh, it's good to have backup plans in place, which is why, I mean, I use PGP for email, which I don't have a backup for email, unfortunately. But, um, but like, uh, I use Jitsi for off-the-record and ZRTP, so encrypted vo uh, VoIP calls like we're doing now, uh, and then messaging. And then I also have another backup of text and, and, and uh, uh, voice app. So like it, it's good that it's good to have a lot of backups in place because we have had stuff fail on us. So, um, so yeah, definitely. Uh, that's that's just good security culture. So, um, so I guess uh, you, you mentioned uh, bug out bags and, and and storable food and all that. So should a freedom still have a bug out location? Uh, I think it it could be valuable. I mean, I definitely have. I just as I said, I spent a couple weeks at my grandmother's farm and kind of got to see what her situation is like having a great amount of food backed up and made me realize like, damn, I'm so underprepared. I think I've got like, I mean, I'm like maybe ahead of the average person, but that doesn't really mean anything. You know what I mean? That, that means like I might last a couple hours longer than them or something, you know? Uh, but I, I definitely think it's important to just, and again, it doesn't have to be some kind of end of the world, like apocalyptic situation that we're thinking about here. I live in Houston and we get hurricanes sometimes from the coast. And when that happens and people are totally unprepared, it happened a few years ago. I mean, everybody tries to leave the city at the last minute. The freeways are just shut down. There's like traffic. Nobody's moving anywhere. All the stores are just emptied out within hours because people start buying up all the water and all the like everything they can pretty much. I mean, people freak out. And we also, <laughs> a couple years ago, there was like a, a rolling power outs across the entire like, state of Texas. And like power was out for three or four days across large parts of the, the entire state. And again, the same thing, people were freaking out, like they didn't know how to, you know, just take care of themselves and what to do. And it really makes me think like if one of those situations, you know, again, it doesn't have to be economic collapse or martial law or anything, just say, you know, a storm, a blizzard or a hurricane, tornado, whatever nature comes through and knocks off your power grid for a certain amount of time, you know, it might not be safe to be where you're at, whether that's in the city or, you know, some, if you're in the country, or the suburbs, I just think it definitely, there's value to having a location that your people like the the unfortunate thing we have is 
our freedom cells definitely were spread out throughout the city. So there may be some instances where, you know, we have like the Freethinker House, our community space, or maybe some, we've talked about having like a storage unit where we just all store food, you know, and just keep putting supplies and things in there. And if it came down to it, we all met there, you know, get what we can and get to some place in the city. Or again, having a second place that's outside far away from the city, because there may be some instances where it's like, no, we need to get the hell away from here. Other mm -hmm. times you might be re realize it's best to stay put depending on what you're dealing with. So. Having some place nearby that's easy to get to and you, where you have supplies that are going to last you for quite a bit, that makes sense. And also having like a second location, like the bug out location, like really get out of town type thing is ideal as well. And, you know, I've talked a little bit with some people about burying supplies in different places, you know. As that's silly, what I was going to mention, yeah. Sound, but <laughs> I mean, like if you've got certain, you know, whether that means firearms or just like food or different things that are like, okay. You know, I've talked to my grandmother and other older farmers uh, like her who worry about a time whenever they're like, you know, when things, when the shit hits the fan, they're coming for my farm. Like, and, you know, I'm just one old person out here. You know, I've got some weapons, but, it, you know, people are going to come take whatever they can out of my garden and then see what I have in my house and then check out my, you know, my survival pantry or whatever. So these are realistic things and having, having a way to protect your family and defend your family and have food. Uh, it, it, it's going to come in, by, in handy later, you know, and if not, then you are just stocked up throughout the year, you know. Exactly. You know, just, you're, there's no harm. Exactly. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. M multiple supply caches, so uh, that's that's definitely an option. Uh, we just discussed survivalism a couple of weeks ago, so this is still fresh in my mind. Uh, or or even since you have, since, like with the Freedom Slide, I think this concept would work really well, uh, multiple safe houses. So uh, you mentioned that you're spread out across the city. Like, let's say, um, I don't know, there's a, um, like, let's just like a, a Hurricane Katrina situation where, like, you have, like, uh, FEMA come in and, like, all of that, and they're shutting down parts of the city. Yeah. Like, let's say, you like, your house is inaccessible, so the members of your Freedom Cell had to a house on the west side of Houston. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. in a different in a different uh, area so yeah there's a lot of ways uh, that, that there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of options when it comes to uh, to freedom cells it seems like absolutely that's why I really enjoy this structure and this idea and again like I don't care what people call it like I've uh, the great thing is I did a and a video a while back on the conscious resistance just what is a freedom cell and that one you know it's, it got some reasonable traction and then I did an interview about agorism counter economics and mentioned freedom cells with uh, uh, the Corbett report and a couple other places so the idea is starting to grow and I've got emails from people in Brazil, from Jersey, from uh, Colorado, uh, somewhere I think maybe in Germany it was, just different places mm, nice. saying like, hey, or New Zealand was one of the places saying like, we're involved in creating a community, we have this similar thing, we never heard of it as freedom cells, but this is what we're doing and different people reaching out trying to say like, let's stay in touch and share resources and share ideas and there's other people out there, uh, like the, uh, the, I think they Tony Garen's one of the dudes. I think he's some. I can't remember where exactly where he's at, but he runs sort of a freedom cell that they call like the Grand Rapids Autonomous uh, Support System or something like mm. that. And they, you know, they meet, they meet and do similar things. And he's trying to. Him and other people are trying to, like I said earlier, build a, a network of these networks. You know, so now we've got people opening up to the idea of freedom cells on the local level. And I think we're going to continue to see this idea grow as people see, like, you know, take your freedom cell. And create a project okay to the day the eight of us are going to build a community garden just like boom show people how this structure is providing value in your life you know and as we do that it's going to be important for us to connect those larger networks again and it seems like we're at that stage where people are starting to see that happen i mean there's definitely i would recommend checking out um the full circle project is a good website and i'll send you these links later if you want to post them um, yeah, right on. Yeah, there's definitely. one like kokio i don't and there's like three other ones new mondo that are basically these are just lists of intentional communities, individuals that are essentially they're doing freedom cell type work. They're not all, I imagine, not all anarchist or, uh, and I'm sure some of them are statist, but within there, it's important, I think, to look and see what's around you. What, again, what resources are available, who you can connect with. You don't have to agree 100% with somebody to do business with them or to learn from them or teach them as well. So that's another thing that's important that I would say to the uh, more strict, like volunteerist crowd is that not to be too rigid in your ability to connect and grow with other people, because if we're going to create decentralized lifestyles, that's going to involve working with people who might not necessarily share all the exact values that we have. You know, that doesn't mean you can't trade some raw milk with them or, you know, uh, hire them to do something or whatever it may be, you know, just, or just be a neighbor to them, exchange ideas and knowledge, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Um, but I mentioned security teams before. Uh, are you familiar with, uh, with that concept? Um, I haven't heard it called that, but I think I, I'm 
familiar with what you're talking about, but go ahead and tell yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so essentially, it's just uh, like a, a small group of people. Typically, like I have like five to seven, just a, a pretty small group of people. Um, Gary Hunt. I had Gary Hunt on for the first edition of the Direct Action series to talk about it, and he's published all this stuff, like his, what his security team did in the '90s, just some crazy shit uh, that I would have never imagined. But, but typically, I, I think the the main difference. I, I see a lot of similarities, but I think the main difference is like security teams like are put together like for like like really really bad situations. Um, but uh, um, yeah, not 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 just prepping and education, etc. I, I don't think that's that's even a part of it. Um, but but the the point here is that security teams are underground. The the only folks that know about the existence of a particular security team are those in it. Uh, so uh, this and this is an important important question here. So our, um, for, and I think I can kind of deduce what, uh, or allude allude to this answer. But are freedom cells above board or are they hidden from the public? I think that again, that's going to depend on each individual freedom cell. You know, there's a what I like, I will say that, for example, like most of the people that are involved in the Houston Freedom Cell are coming from the Houston Freethinkers community, the activist community that we've built over the last five or six years. So those same people are at the public meetings, but Freedom Cell meetings aren't advertised publicly. We don't like post like, hey, this is what our Freedom Cell talked about. Like, so there definitely is an aspect of it that is like the underground. You know, obviously to build and spread this idea, we got to talk about it. You know, yeah, and let yeah, people yeah. know that this thing exists so people can start organizing. But as I said earlier, um, and I've sort of always kind of just like half jokingly alluded to this to other people when I when talk about the free thinkers that like, hey, there's a public face of the free thinkers and there's, you know, some other things <laughs> you don't hear about, you know. And I think that that is important just again as a culture of security. But while you're out there, like as your group of people, it is, I would say, important if you're doing public acts through this freedom cell structure to document that and to promote that. So people, the average person who isn't thinking of like, you know, a revolution against the state, but is just, they're looking for a better life, right? They just, they generally understand things aren't, um, aren't good, but rather than seeing you as this like violent force in the community that's ready to take on the state, they see you guys out there like, oh wow, they're doing good in the community. They're using the structure to spread ideas. And I may not necessarily agree with everything they're doing, but I'm happy they're out there. I've had people tell me that. And to me, that's a great compliment when someone's like, you know, definitely, yeah. I definitely don't agree with everything that you're about. But I think you being there is better than you not being there. And I'm thankful that you are. And I'm like, that's cool. I appreciate that. You know, it's good for us to be able to value each other, even if we don't, you know, because generally we're working to the, towards the same goals. There will be times when, you know, certain views clash. And that's important to acknowledge that. But um, what I would say is as far as the difference between what you're describing as security teams or freedom cells and the underground above ground aspect, um, Again, it depends on each freedom cell, but also maybe within a certain freedom cell, certain aspects are the ones that I've described to you about, and other things are just things that aren't meant to be said out loud, you know. So it's, it all depends on what people are focusing on. I still advocate, of course, the nonviolent uh, evolution or revolution of the mind, but the other thing that I do believe that freedom cells, and this is where I think that it's like the survivalism aspect, the knowledge diffusion aspect of freedom cells, the community, it's all important and beautiful, but I also definitely see it as like, security and defense, you know, and I've uh, written a couple articles about the auto defenses in uh, Mexico where different parts of the country where the this federal government just has no power and, the, you know, cartels have taken over where people have just started forming decentralized community defense, uh, you know, groups basically and they're, they're spontaneous, you know, there may be certain people that volunteer to different parts of the, the area, but generally it's like a spontaneous thing. Like if something pops up, people take up their arms and they come defend the community. They're not going around, you know, harassing people for no reason. They're not a regular police officer. And uh, it's, you know, so that's, I think, is a model, although like it's coming from a not ideal situation like violence and uh, the, the horrible crime that's happening there. But you can see in the failure of the state, people come together and they create something, you know, they're not just going to sit by like, okay, these gangsters are taking over our community. Some people have done that, but these people are basically like, you know what, we're sick and tired of this shit. Like, we're going to take care of our communities. If that means taking up arms and having to defend ourselves, that's what you do. You know, it's not an ideal situation. We don't want to live that way forever. But you get to a point where you are organized against the criminals coming into your community and you push back, you know, and you, you set the, a new a line in the sand. And when you look at the way that the police treat the average, you know, human being, citizen, uh, I see them as an imposing, opposing force that, you know, is coming into our free communities that are generally peaceful. You know, of course, there's people out there that commit crimes, but we're not talking about cops stopping people from murder. We're talking about cops just harassing people or doing nonviolent, victimless things and, you know, abusing them. And uh, I did a video called uh, How to Organize Against Violent Cops. And it's basically talking about using the freedom cell structure 
to and to use it to role play you know have people in your community and one of them be the angry violent asshole cop coming in there you know and I've, thank you yes I've yes role, role playing police interrogations fantastic yes I, I've, I've done that yeah i've uh because i've had this idea in my head and i played it over you know just watching different videos of people being murdered by police officers you know people talk about body cameras and i think cop watching is obviously valuable a lot of things a lot of times the cops back off because they know they have a camera on them but there are also other times where you videotape the cops straight up murders they don't care and they <laughs> yeah. get away with it you know so i've thought this over my head i'm like i don't think i could just sit there and watch somebody getting abused and definitely not kill like in front of me without like going to intervene just like human to human be like what the fuck are you doing you know whether you're a cop or not you know and I thought, okay, obviously if I do that, the cop's just gonna shoot me because I'm just some single individual coming at him, you know? But if you had a community that was prepared to nonviolently defend itself, maybe open carrying, you know, again, just making a sort of assertive measure to that officer, like, hey, chill the fuck out. You just knocked that person down. Okay, they were committing a crime or whatever, but you don't have any you know, reason to be abusing that with that way. And just try to defuse the situation and if needed, disarming the police officer, like kicking them out of the community, making it clear that like, hey, we're gonna handle this ourselves. You're not needed. Get the fuck out of here. And imagine if that started happening, you know, different freedom cells around the country where all of a sudden cops are starting to like communicate with each other, like, damn, like these people are starting to kind of form their own <laughs> little community groups and they're pushing back against us, you know. But because the problem with it being um, again, spontaneous order is important, but that spontaneous order comes with after you're doing role playing and sort of practicing, your community is prepared, you know, so it's spontaneous, but you're prepared. What I saw when I went to Ferguson and uh, you know, Boston bombing and different cities like that, where there's been a police state erected and it was totally just unexpected, is that people are freaking out. They're all over the place. You know, there's like so much chaos. You've got all these different groups and factions trying to fight for like, who's organizing this or who's doing this, you know, like follow our chances, all this silly crap. And you look across the street. And you see these Humvees and you see all like the military and the police with their military toys. They have a plan. They are totally prepared. You know what I mean? They're looking at yep. like, all these jokers on the street like, all right, we're about to round up all these people. They're not even ready for it. You know, just throw a couple of smoke bombs their way. They're going to start flipping out and then we just corral them all together. They've got a plan, dude. So people should be equally organized, you know, when it comes to what happens when there's a breakdown like that or when a violent police officer comes in there how do you handle it how do you respond to that especially when you know increasingly that you can't count on the court systems to bring you any justice you know yeah so powered together so um i'm not promoting violence against cops but i'm also not promoting standing by and getting killed or abused or letting your community members be abused and uh, murdered I, I definitely don't advocate that i think using the freedom cell structure to develop that doing role playing really practicing what you would do in these situations and really trying to think about it because I feel like some people as well on one extreme they're just like stand back do nothing videotape and hope that the courts take care of it the other side is like people fantasize about these situations where one day they're going to get to flip over cop cars and burn them down and like fuck all the cops and shit and I can totally understand that sentiment but those people typically aren't the first ones stepping up to the plate to defend someone when the cops are there so we True, need to be yeah. realistic about okay, a cop is here and he's got a gun pointed at you got you and your friends, you know, and he's holding one of them. Like, how do you respond, you know, without getting yourself shot? And that's a lot more diff I've been in that situation, dude. I've had plenty of guns, like, pointed at my face by cops, you know, DHS, different people where they're like, you know, we don't care what you think. We're about to take you away for 72 hours and we can lock you in a hole and all this kind of stuff, you know. It's it's intense. you got to think, you know, right there in that moment. Yep. And being prepared for that as a community has so much value. Oh yeah, it, it it definitely does. It definitely does. And and I'm like I, I know I already said this, but I'm glad you mentioned role playing police interrogations. Uh, Kyle Rain wrote an article on that. Kyle Rain from the Last Bastille blog wrote an article on that a couple of years ago. If anyone's interested in checking that out, I don't have a short link for it. It's uh, off the cuff, but uh, just go to uh, lastbastille.com, type in role playing police interrogations. Uh, and yeah, I definitely recommend people start doing that because uh, uh, and obviously like just some basic traffic stops, like the, not like a not a crisis like you're you're discussing, but like uh you got to survive the encounter like there are a lot of people that say well you can you, you might be able to talk your way out of a ticket well yeah or you could or you could slip up and uh give them permission to search your car they might find something else etc cetera, etc cetera. so just yeah try to survive the encounter that's the goal just survive the encounter but uh, uh very good very good um so uh one other thing in regards to security teams i think this was a concept created by gary hunt but uh um, uh, an important feature is a dead man call. Uh, so, for example, if you're in my dead man call, I would call you at, say, like at 5 p.m. every single day. And if you hadn't from me, heard, heard from me within an hour, uh, you'd alert the rest of the members of the of uh, the Freedom Cell and proceed with, with whatever the standard protocol is. Nice. Uh, so do you think that could be useful uh, for, for, uh, for Freedom Cells? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, if 
especially if you start to if you start to feel like you're working on projects that are putting anyone in danger like you know um, you know you're developing some kind of new tool or their technology or idea that's really going to be rev revolutionary and put a threat towards the state um, or just generally in a situation where I, this is the reality every day is that activists people who are out there speaking are more and more seen as uh, you know a force that that is dangerous in the eyes of the state so just yeah. by choosing to go out there, because this is the other thing is when I start talking to people about these ideas and I start talking to people about getting land and you know, building this community, because increasingly I can't see myself, I mean, I haven't for a long time. I've never seen the answer coming to the ballot box. I don't think that there's any hope for just launching some sort of violent assault and being successful. There's, you know, obviously a lack of organization, even if that was something I believed in. Um, so I increasingly feel like living in this world. I can't just simply keep using their systems and being dependent on their systems of power, of food production, of the state itself, of you know, all these, this, I just don't want any part of it. I want to create and build something that I feel is in line with my values or as close as I can get to it in this status monopoly world, you know, and that means living with a community of people who are similarly minded, trying to promote uh, sustainable permaculture and ways to just take care of your own self and the philosophical aspect of it. Um, so for me, in order to be able to do that, you know, I have to, I have to develop this freedom cell structure. I can't be stuck within within their world. And I just think that that's another aspect too, is, is being able to see how this can help you exit from the state, not be stuck completely in their system, and uh, and moving forward on that front. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and 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 yeah, I I, I yeah, I certainly agree. Um, yeah, gotta find. Uh, uh, Okay, got to find freedom right now in, in our own lives and then with some of these concepts like the freedom cells uh you can actually kind of start maybe to break away from this state which would, which would definitely be a plus and yeah you know like we, we talked about guerrilla warfare with uh with Kyle Raid and just war theory uh probably a month or two ago i remember the exact day um but uh um, it, it is it is a, an aspect of direct action but yeah i i don't think it's a it's necessarily a good idea i mean you look at the the constitutionalist patriots who i mean yeah obviously they want a revolution to restore the constitution um but uh, it's, it's it's kind of sad too on that front because uh, there was uh, um, there was one I, I and I, I Gary Hunt wrote an article on this too but uh, they they couldn't even set up a, just a picnic uh, and uh, it, it's really yeah it's it's really really sad and I don't think that's that that's the option right now um, obviously self defense I think is self defense is obviously always permitted but um, but yeah I, I don't see that as as being a very very good idea I, I definitely so, don't I want to throw one thing your way man just ask your opinion on something if you don't mind. Mm -hmm because we're talking strategy and things. And I actually just did a video about this. It should be coming out in a few days. Um, but, you know, the reason, again, like I was, the point I was trying to make just a minute ago is that voting's not going to do it for me. Violence isn't going to do it for me. Electoral change isn't going to do it for me. I just need to create the world that I want. Freedom Cells allows that. And I think, you know, what we're trying to offer those of us who are focusing on this when we're talking strategy is a healthy alternative to the craziness that has been put forward in many ways. I mean, this past year, you've seen libertarians for Trump, right? I mean, you've got... Um, you know, somebody who I consider a friend, although definitely I will say we're increasingly having uh, heated debates, but Adam Kokesh, you know, pushing people to look for 2020 to his presidential run, which I just told him how much that frustrates me that, you know, he's like yep. keeping people in that world for another four years just by giving them hope. And, uh, but so my, my, my uh, question here is, is in your mind, besides just whether you think like the strategy will work or not, but do you think running for president is an act of aggression? Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I I, I consider. I, I consider. I mean. Um, and this is this is divisive within libertarian anarchist circles. But I do see voting as an act of aggression. I mean, even if you're voting for a libertarian candidate that um, is trying is running on the platform of uh, peaceful dissolution of the federal government in 2020, or if it's uh, uh, or if it's a local sheriff in Michigan or whatever it is, uh, <laughs> um, you're you're still you're still <laughs> giving you're still giving your sanction to whatever whatever is done in the election uh and and even if uh like there they're gonna be some things like yeah like okay like a sheriff could like not send a pot like a, a pot dealer to jail or something he might not throw him in jail but um so he's still gonna have to at least uh acquiesce to uh to some things i mean politics is all about uh is all about uh concessions um now is if running for office an act of aggression um <clears throat> I don't know. I, I, that's, that's a good question. I don't know how I'd answer that. I, I would say yes, but I don't, I don't have uh, a, a good, a good answer for uh, 
reasoning that. But explain to you what I why I think that it is. This is basically what I say in the video because I think obviously, like you said, the first step is like some people are already off the. You know, they're like, oh no, before you even get started, the fact that you're telling somebody to vote for you, that's an act of aggression. Like, let's put that aside for a moment and just say that that itself isn't. So. What I'm asking is, you know, even because what I, I made a Facebook post about this and I was like, you know, what, let me extrapolate on this idea and do a video about it. And basically it was saying whenever somebody runs for office, whether it's Bernie Sanders and promising like free health care, free college, whatever, or Donald Trump going to build a wall or Hillary Clinton, whatever she's promising, you know, they're see promising what the people that they want to follow. They're promising their biggest hopes and dreams they are building up through that. Right. And they're also trying to get their enemies to be afraid, you know, to get their followers to be afraid of their enemies. Like, you know, you must elect me because I'm going to give you all of this beautiful things. You're going to have everything you want. But if you don't, all of your worst nightmares are going to come true. So it's a total manipulated system is what I see as well. And whether it seems, seems like fraud, like you like even sorry to interrupt, but it's, it seems like fraud to me, like Co like uh, obviously like Kokesh isn't running to win, but but still like he's like he's. It's going off of the premise that if he gets one, I think it's one percent of the vote, then like that would be like a huge step forward or something I mean, like that. I but but there's 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 no there's there's no hope there. There's no hope in politics. So I like mean, I I'd, I'd still see it as a it's, fraud. It's so All right, and uh, not sure what happened there, guys. That a little bit of a technical technical difficulty. I'm gonna go from uh, screen capturing the video, and now we're just gonna turn it, the entire thing into an audio file. Uh, so uh, sorry about that, Derek. Uh, before before we had that little uh, that tech uh, that technical difficulty, um, you were talking about uh, um, uh, running for office being aggression. Yeah. So um, the point I'm trying to make is that you know you discuss maybe there is a difference between running for local sheriff compared to running for president, right? I mean maybe. It, you could still say that it applies, like because on a local level, if you're going to do, if you're going to have uh, sheriff's abilities, executive abilities, and take, you know, make unilateral change, then obviously not everyone that those decisions are going to affect is going to agree with them. And uh, I feel like as voluntarists, not only just that the whole philosophy is predicated on, you know, not using the political system for change, mm -hmm. that my friend Coach Kesh has talked about for a long time. I think. You know that's kind of going against what he's promoted for a long time people can evolve and maybe he's going towards a point where he believes that political change is the best but i think that and just a couple points what i think is wrong with adam's um campaign and then why i think no matter who's running for president is an act of aggression first thing being that uh, again he helped lead myself and plenty of other people to agorism to agorism to volunteerism promoting the ideas of counter economics working outside the state and uh, you know, seeking change elsewhere, he started to do this homestead. I told him directly, like, dude, just build more of these. Like, take the money because he said it's going to take at least five million dollars to get a reasonable campaign. I mean, I'm sure it's going to take much more than that to get a losing campaign through a third party. You know, and and I'm like, if you, he's like, well, I'm not running to be president. I'm running to be not president. And I said, I don't think that you're really like the people who follow you necessarily get it because look on the comment section of the videos. They're like, yes, I, I I thought I was done with voting, but if you run, I'll vote again. Like, you know, it's just like. People well, putting hope in the system. their hope back in that system, you know, and then like, if, I'm like, if, at least make it clear, look, guys, I'm not going to win. This is all about, you know, creating a movement. And it is what he's told me is like, I can move the movement along, you know, advance it 20 plus years. You know, like if, if we all keep doing what we're doing, it spreads and it spreads. But if I do another huge campaign, maybe it's as big as Ron Paul's campaign, then we're going to create a whole new generation of anarchists. And I just, I totally disagree with it. Now, as far as the act of aggression, now, when voluntarists, when anarchists, and I think of all stripes, see somebody choosing to use the state. Some left anarchists will allow uh, violence of the state to be you know, accepted if they're like, okay, well, they're using it to build a welfare state. They're doing something that, this is why most people, other anarchists, volunteers would say they don't have principles because they're just like, they say they're anti-status or you know, anti-hierarchy, et cetera. But then if the state wants to do something that they feel is just like stop climate change or do whatever, then they're okay with using state power. You know, it's just, People want it, the right and the left want to only use the state to, you know, uh, suppress their enemies and to get their little pet causes across. But the voluntarists, at least I believe and what I do believe, is that we recognize that all of that is wrong, you know, because it's being done with coercion, whether it's the action is just or not. You know, you can say, yeah, OK, it's cool. They did this good thing and that maybe brought value to the community, but it was still done on a system based on theft and based on violence. So whether you're promising to run for president and you want to install carbon tax because you think it's going to you know, fix pollution. There's going to be a large portion of the people who are okay with that because they think that's doing some good. The other people in a dem democracy or you know, whatever democratic republic who disagree are still forced to go along with that. And most of us would say we view that as wrong. So what happens when somebody promises to eliminate the federal government, but the people that are part of the population 
they want a federal government. They want, yeah, they they're, still they're, want those they, programs. And, yeah, and, and, yeah, and they you're, become you're exactly the right, yeah. So the point is that the change can't, you can't force anarchism or decentralization on people because also what I think you'll end up having is just counter revolutionaries. Do you think, really think that if somebody came along and he's basically promising to be the benevolent dictator, just give me that power and I promise I'll abolish it all with one fell swoop. We'll start to do all these things. And I, I know in the book Freedom, he talks about localization. I encouraged Adam, dude, make that a bigger part of your little campaign. Make it clear that, hey, this is really about localizing and you know, the idea of getting rid of the federal government is to, you know, decentralize and build your own communities up instead of this idea of like, I'm going to be the last president you ever need. Just this. I really think, though, we have to look at those people. If you want to create a more free world, you can't force it on other people. And I've had some people say it's not force if you're promising to go be president and then remove the biggest aggressor, which is the federal government. But that's just from your opinion. What about the people who, for whatever reason, whether we agree or not, they want the state? I basically, if you want to stay whatever, as long as your state is not aggressing on my freedom and will allow me to sort of opt out of all of that, if we could have that system where we could have autonomous communities, I think more people would choose to vacate the state after a while and they would leave and start to form new things. Maybe there would be some constitutional communities and other things, but generally I don't think people would stay under the federal government. So Adam's right that people are dissatisfied in that, but you can't come be the dictator and force it upon those people. Because not only do I think others will just try to reinstate it and rebuild it into something new and yeah. go, oh, no, we're going to bring the federal government back even stronger. But if people are going to come to the same conclusions we have, they have to do it on their own. The change has to start from within themselves. They have to have that moment of like, wow, you know what? This is wrong. There is a better way. And then it becomes a part of their philosophy and their ideas. And then they'll want to do that voluntarily rather than having to do it through edict as president. Yeah, that, that that is true, and yeah, I, I I've said many, yeah, I've 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 said this before too. You can't force freedom on the people. That doesn't that's, that seems like a contradiction there. But uh, absolutely. Um, but yeah, very very good. So so I guess uh, um, we are about a minute over, which is fine. We can always uh, go over on that on that second break. But uh, I guess uh, any closing thoughts about uh, freedom cells? Uh, no, just check out the videos. Check out you know listen to the ideas that we presented here. Um, I'll send you all the links of some of the websites I was talking about. And hopefully we can get more people who are looking for like-minded people or at least people who are solutions focused to come together, start building more of these. And I think it, we're going to see it play a large role in our, us advancing freedom in the next few generations. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. And yeah, if you want to send me those things, I'll definitely put those uh, in, the, uh, in the show notes. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I guess, uh, so fantastic. Uh, uh, we definitely love to uh, have you back on. Uh, I've, I've mentioned this to you a couple times. I tagged you in it too, but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, uh, Rayo's Vanu, the search for uh, personal freedom when you have a chance at, uh, I know you've been, you've, I know you've always been kind of looking back into like the, uh, uh, libertarian history, like, uh, yeah. the, the left libertarianism back in the sixties and seventies, like back when Conklin was doing mm -hmm. it and Rothbard. And uh, I think that's, that seems like it'd be right in your wheelhouse. So, awesome. uh, I'll check it out. right on, right on. So, uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Derek. And, uh, you can check out his site at theconsciousresistance.com.